Chapter 18 of Anthony Trent, Master Criminal, by Wyndham Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Chapter 18. The Great Black Bird. There was exactly one week to the night of the fancy dress dance of the uplands from the time that the Northern Sisters gave the abstractor so much information. Every moment of it was carefully taken up by that calculating gentleman. For example, on the following morning, Wednesday, he played a round with the club's champion, an amateur of some skill. Dangerfield, posing for the moment as a warm admirer of the local player, followed the two on their match, betting freely on Blackhall, his clubmate. Also, he violated every rule of the royal and ancient game by speaking as Trent made his strokes. Never in his ten years of golf had Trent played such a game. It was characteristic of him to do his best when conditions were worst. When the game was over at the thirteenth hole, Dangerfield turned crossly to Blackhall. "'You played a rotten game,' he said. "'I never played a better,' that golfer exclaimed. "'The whole trouble with me was that I was up against a better man.' It may be observed that Blackhall was a sportsman. Dangerfield was astonished and gratified next day when he was saying some approaching to find Trent watching his efforts in a not unfriendly spirit. "'The trouble with you,' said the younger player graciously, "'is that you chop your stroke instead of carrying through. I'll show you what I mean.' In the half-hour he devoted to Dangerfield, he improved the millionaire's game six strokes to a round. "'It would be no fun to play with you,' he said, when Dangerfield again invited him. "'But I hate to see a man trying to approach as you did, when a little help could put him right.' Thus were any Dangerfield suspicions disarmed. He helped him once or twice more, and on every occasion insisted that the hovering attendant be sent away. "'Your keeper,' said Trent genially, "'puts me off my stroke.' "'Keeper?' grinned Dangerfield. "'I'm not as bad as that. He's my valet.' Two days before the ball at the uplands, it was observed that Anthony Trent visited the nineteenth hole more frequently and stayed there longer. He was playing less golf now. The bartender confided in Mr. Dangerfield, who was also a consistent patron, that he was drinking heavily. "'I guess,' said the tender of the bar, with a sapience of his kind, "'that he's one of these quiet periodic souses. They tell me he has the stuff sent up to his room.' "'Too bad,' said Mr. Dangerfield, shaking his head as he ordered another. It was true that to Trent's room much dry gin and lemon juice found its way, together with siphons of iced carbonic. The carbonic and the lemon juice was drunk, since a belated heat-wave was visiting the Sunset Park Hotel. The gin found its way into his flower-laden window-boxes, which should have bloomed into juniper berries. Trent liked to drink as well as any other golfer, but he found that it just took the keen edge off his nerves. He was less keen to realize danger, and too ready to meet a risk when he drank. As a conscientious workman, he put it behind him when professionally engaged. On the night of the ball he was, to quote a bellboy, dead to the world, which proves that bellboys may be deceived by appearances. On the night of the ball he was keyed up to his highest personal efficiency. Physically he was at his best. His muscles were always hard and his wind good. The resisting exercises he practised maintained the former, and a little running every day aided the latter. The great costume ball was to take place on the 3rd of September, when the sun would set at half-past six. The uplands was no more than a half-hour motor-spin distance from the hotel. The time was set at half-past nine, which meant few would be there before ten. It was plain, then, that Mrs. Jerome Dangerfield would not commence her preparations for dressing until after the dinner. She was devoted to the pleasures of the table as her maid lamented when she harnessed her mistress within her corsets. Looking from his window, Trent saw that the sun had retired behind clouds early in the afternoon. Darkness would not be delayed, and the success of his venture depended upon this. Reviewing the amazing events of the evening of September the 3rd, it is only fair to let Jerome Dangerfield relieve his feelings in a letter to his closest friend, the President of the First Agricultural Bank of New York. "'You were right in warning me not to bring the Mount Aubyn ruby up to this place. It was Adele's fault. She wanted it for the wedding. The damn thing has gone, Steve, vanished into thin air.' 
If you told me what I'm going to tell you, I should say you were crazy. The people here and the fool police thought I'd been drinking. I'd had three or four cocktails, but what is that to me, or you? I was absolutely in possession of my senses. We dined early, and we dined alone. At eight I went down for the jewels Adele wanted to wear. The ruby was the pièce de résistance, of course. I went down my own private stairway, as usual, and unlocked the door leading from it to the hotel lobby. Devlin is here, and O'Brien, but they were both outside keeping tabs on strangers. The papers have played this costume ball up so much that every crook in the land knew what we had to offer in the way of loot. Graham, the hotel clerk, came with me to the private stairway, and swears he pushed the door to as I started to go up the stairs. And he swears also that, although it wasn't lighted as well as usual, there was nobody in sight. There are steep stairs, Steve, but they save me rubbing shoulders with every man or woman who might want to get acquainted in the public elevators. And naturally, I wasn't carrying a fortune where any crook could get a crack at me. Read this carefully. I was on the fifteenth step of the flight of twenty-two steps when the thing happened. The light was dim because one of the bulbs wasn't working, and the only illumination came from a red light at the head of the stairway. I was holding the jewel box in both hands, resting it almost on my chest, when the thing happened. There was suddenly a noise that might have been made by the beating of wings, and something swooped out of nowhere and hit me on my wrists with such violence that I went backwards down the stairs and was unconscious for more than ten minutes. On each wrist there is an abrasion that might be caused by the sharp bill of a big bird. I am bruised all over and have three stitches over one eye. I found the box lying on one of the steps, closed as I had held it. The only thing that was missing was the Mont Aubin ruby. Devlin and O'Brien have all kinds of theories, but I told them I wanted the stone back, and if they didn't get it, I wouldn't have them any longer in my employ. Devlin says he will swear a car passed him on the Boston Road yesterday, containing some continental crooks who used to operate along the Italian and French Riviera. He's full of wild fancies, and swears I shall get the ruby back. I'm not so sure. I've given up the theory that it was a great black bat which hit me, but whatever it was, it was a stunt pulled by a master craftsman who is laughing at Devlin and his kind. Can you imagine a crook who would leave behind what this fellow did? I wish you'd go to the Pemberton Detective Agency and get them to send someone up here capable of handling the situation. I shall be coming down to New York as soon as I'm able. I'm too much bruised to play golf, but when I do, I shall win some of your money. I've had some lessons from a crackerjack golfer up here who goes round the eighteen holes in anything from seventy-two to seventy-eight. My stance was wrong, and I wasn't gripping right. So much for Jerome Dangerfield. When Devlin and O'Brien examined the scene of the crime, they immediately noticed that some fifteen feet above the ground level a stained-glass window lighted the stairway. "'Of course!' they exclaimed in unison. "'That is the solution!' But the theory did not hold water, as the soil of the flower-beds showed no sign of a ladder or any footmark. They had been raked over that afternoon, and the gardener swore no foot but his had set foot in this enclosed garden which supplied the hotel tables with blooms. An examination of the window showed no helpful finger-marks. It was an indoor job, they declared, amending their first opinion. But they were thorough workmen in their way. For instance, Anthony Trent, reclining fully dressed across his bed, with cigarette stubs and emptied glasses about him, within thirty minutes of the robbery, was evidently in fear of interruption. An onlooker would have seen him take three gin fizzes in rapid succession until indeed his face wore a faint flush. He listened keenly when outside his door footsteps lingered, and he was snoring alcoholically when the hotel clerk entered, bringing with him Messrs. Devlin and O'Brien. "'He's been like this for days,' Graham, the clerk, asserted. "'If it wasn't that he was no trouble and made no noise, I should have told him to get out.' "'A pity,' Graham shook his head. "'One of the pleasantest spoken men in the hotel, and some golfer, they tell me.' "'You leave us,' Devlin commanded. "'We're acting for the boss, and it'll be all right.' Out of the corner of his eye, Trent watched the two trained men make a thorough examination of his room and effects. Indeed, their thoroughness gave him ideas which were later to prove of use. But they drew blank. 
they examined the two fly-rods he had brought with him and a collapsible landing-net with great care tapping the handles and balancing the rods they sighed when nothing was found this guy's all right said o'brien i don't know said devlin he looks a little too much like a moving picture hero to suit me he may have it on him at this moment trent sat up with an effort and looked from one to the other of the visitors as drunken men do it appeared not easy to get them in proper focus devlin was not easily put in the wrong his manner was most respectful mr dangerfield wants you to join him in a little game of bridge he began ingratiatingly sure said the inebriate any time at all he attempted to get up you can't go like this devlin assured him you'd better sober up a bit take a gold bath o'brien obligingly turned the water on and five minutes later devlin assisted him into the tub while o'brien examined the clothes he had left in his sitting-room then the two left him abruptly and made no more mention of bridge or dangerfield trent rolled on the bed chuckling the honours were his the great black bird swooping from nowhere to relieve dangerfield of his great ruby and other stones of value to strike that worthy upon his strong wrists with such startling effect as to make him fall down a dozen steps was capable of a simpler explanation than he had supposed trent a week before the robbery had observed with peculiar attention the window leading to dangerfield's private stairway he could see one easy approach to it and one of greater difficulty the first was approached by a stepladder the second was a great arm of the enormous tree that reared its head above the hotel roof this arm hung down from the roof almost twenty feet above the little window he believed that his weight would bring it swaying down to the window ledge he tried it one moonless night and found the scheme feasible already the chiller mountain breezes following the heat spell were making visitors close their windows on the evening of the third of september he stole from his room by climbing over the roof until he came to the side where the big tree was in one hand he held a coil of rope to hold the branch when his weight was taken off it this rope he tied to the iron staple of the shutter outside the window it was easy to open this dropping silently onto the stairs he unscrewed the bulb of the light until the staircase was in partial darkness tense he knelt on the edge of the window and waited for the millionaire and as the man came in sight he suddenly lifted from a step his landing net the same collapsible one devlin had examined with such care but this time it was draped in dark material to conceal its form the brass rim sharp and heavy struck dangerfield's wrists as he held the box by both hands on a level with his heart into the open net the precious casket fell silently trent was in his room ten minutes ere dangerfield came to consciousness his next move seemed strange and unnecessary with a used golf ball in his pocket he slid down the veranda posts until he came by devious routes to the shed in which the lockers were of those who used the links it had long since been closed for the night parker unfastened dangerfield's locker and placed the ball in the pocket where it lay with others of similar age and make he was able to return to his room unobserved it was less than a half hour afterward that he received his call from the two detectives although he was anxious to get on the links again and breathe the air of the pine woods he was careful not to undo his artistic preparations it was noticed that no more drink was sent to his room there came instead ice water and strong coffee he was getting over it they said two days later he was out on the links and made a peculiarly bad round taking ten more strokes than usual dangerfield watched him from the piazza one of his arms was in a sling cut the rough stuff out said dangerfield that's the second time you topped your ball trent passed a hand across his face possibly to hide a smile i guess i'll have to he returned simply it was that damned heat wave that got me going it happened that the dangerfields and trent returned to new york on the same train devlin and o'brien were in attendance trent noticed that when devlin's eye fell on the golf bag over his shoulder he frowned so far the ruby had not been recovered and here was a piece of baggage that might hold crown jewels over devlin's broad shoulders his master's golf bag was suspended cheerily and with respect he approached the crack player let me hold your golf bag sir he said with a ready smile i'll put it on the train for you 
Trent relinquished it with relief. Thank you, he returned. It will be a help. He had long ago noticed that his own bag and danger fields were alike, save for the initials. They were both of white canvas, bound with black leather. Watching the smiling Devlin with a well-disguised curiosity, he saw that Dangerfield's bag had been substituted for his own. Devlin had done exactly as Trent expected him to do, and had, in the doing of it, saved him much trouble. There were not many people in his Pullman. Dangerfield had his private car. None saw Anthony Trent open the ball pouch on the Dangerfield bag and extract therefrom an aged and somewhat dented ball. He balanced it almost lovingly in his hand. Never in the history of the great game had a ball been seen with the worth of this one. And yet he had so cunningly extracted its core and repaired it when once the Mount Aubyn ruby was nestling in its strange home that detection was unlikely, even were an examination made. A porter had the Dangerfield bag and Trent's suitcase when Devlin came up to him. He was no longer obliging. He had spent wearisome hours in the privacy of the Dangerfield car, examining every part of the Trent impedimenta. The task had wearied him and had been fruitless. "'You got the boss's clubs,' he said shortly. Languidly, Trent examined what his porter carried. "'You're to blame for it,' he answered. And as Mr. Dangerfield came up, raised his voice a little. He knew Devlin suspected him, and he sensed that some day the two would meet as open foes. "'This man of yours,' cried Trent, "'try to give me your clubs instead of my own. I wouldn't lose mine for anything.' "'You crack golfers couldn't do anything without your own specially built clubs,' jeered the millionaire. "'I believe it's half the game.' Trent smiled. "'There's something in the bowl, too,' he admitted." and had difficulty in keeping his face straight. Mrs. Kinney was delighted to see her employer home again, and hurried to a convenient delicatessen store so that he might be fed. It was when she came back that her eye caught sight of the brass lamp from Benares. Where had been the unsightly gap caused by her breaking of the red glass was now a piece which glittered gaily. "'Why, you've had it mended, sir,' she cried. "'I feel I ought to pay for it,' since it was my carelessness which broke it. "'I'm glad you did,' he laughed. "'If you hadn't, I shouldn't have got this.' He looked at it with pride. "'Do you know, Mrs. Kinney, I like this one better.' "'It makes the other ones look common, though,' she commented. "'You're right,' he admitted. "'I think I shall have to replace them, too.'" End of chapter 18